we've narrated the hadith from an unbroken chain to the musnad of al-imam Ahmed ibn Hanbal. The musnad of Ahmed ibn Hanbal is one of the largest collections of hadith that we have available. In it, there are about 40,000 hadith. And according to some of the ulama, there's not a single fabricated hadith in the musnad of Imam Ahmed. So there's difference of opinion concerning what level the hadith are. Some of the scholars say every single hadith in the musnad of Ahmed is hasan. That's the position of Imam Suyuti rahimahullah ta'ala. Some of them say, no, there are weak hadith in it, but no hadith is fabricated. Al-Hafiz al-Iraqi, Zainuddin al-Iraqi rahimahullah ta'ala said that some are Zainuddin al-Iraqi, is one of the great Shafi'i Muhaddis scholars. He said that some of the hadith in Musnad Ahmed are fabricated. And Al-Imam ibn Jawzi, the Hanbali Faqih and Muhaddis, he also mentioned that some of the hadith in Musnad Ahmed are fabricated. Al-Hafiz ibn Hajar al-Asqalani the one who wrote the most famous commentary in Sahih Bukhari, he came and he answered every single one of those claims. So he refuted all of the claims of Al-Hafiz al-Iraqi, one by one, and of Al-Imam Ibn al-Jawzi, and he concluded that there's not a single fabricated hadith in the Musnad of Al-Imam Ahmed ibn Hanbal. So it was the hadith is in uh, Musnad Ahmad and the Musnad of Imam Ad-Darimi rahimahullah ta'ala whose Musnad uh, is not as strong as the Musnad of Ahmad ibn Muhammad. And he said this and Imam al we emphasized that we narrated from them bi isnadin hasani. The isnad is uh, hasan. And then we move on to the 28th hadith. So Imam al-Nawawi narrated through an unbroken chain of narration to Abi Najih Irbad ibn Sariya radiyallahu ta'ala anhu wa arda who said qala rasulullah sallallahu alayhi uh, sorry who said wa adana rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam the prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam uh, admonished us and he gave us advice in some narration, he said after Fajr. Baliga. It was a strong advice. Wajilat minhal qulub. From which the hearts trembled. Wa dharafat minhal uyun. And the eyes teared. Fakulna, we said, Ya Rasulallah, ka'annaka maw'idatu, ka'annaha maw'idatu muwaddi'in fa'awsina. So we said, Ya Rasulullah, this is like a parting advice. So give us more, yani give us more advice. The Prophet Wasallam said, Usikum bi taqwa Allahi wa sam'i wa ta'a. I advise you to have the taqwa of Allah Azza wa Jal and to hear and obey. Wa in ta'ammara alaykum abdun habashiyun. Even if an Ethiopian slave uh, attains leadership over you. فَإِنَّهُ مَنْ يَعِشْ مِنْكُمْ فَسَيَرَى إِخْتِلَافًا كَثِيرًا Because any one of you who would live long enough would see a lot of differences. فَعَلَيْكُمْ بِسُنَّتِي So hold on to my sunnah. وَسُنَّةَ الْخُلَفَاءَ الرَّاشِدِينَ الْمَهْدِيِّينَ And the sunnah of the khulafa, the leaders who are rashidin, the righteous leaders, al Mahdiin, who are guided. Addu alayha bin nawajith. Bite onto it with your molars. Wa iyyakum wa muhdathati al umur. And I warn you against new matters. Fa inna kulla bid'atin dalala. Because every new or any uh, or every innovated matter is misguidance. Rawahu Abu Dawood wa Tirmidhi wa qala hadithun. Hassan Sahih. It was narrated by Imam Abu Dawood and the Tirmidhi, and the Tirmidhi said it is hadith, it's a hadith that is Hassan Sahih. So it was narrated by Abu Najih Irbad ibn Sariya radiallahu anhu. Irbad ibn Sariya, 
was from among the companions of the Sufa, Ahlu Sufa. We've spoken about them many times. And he was among the seven Bakka'un who we've referred to a few lessons ago. The Bakka'un are the people who came crying to the Prophet ﷺ because they didn't have yeah, enough money to get equipment for one of the battles. It was seven companions. And they came asking the Prophet ﷺ to carry them, meaning to provide equipment for them. And the Prophet ﷺ said, I cannot find anything. We don't have extra. And they went away crying. The Quran describes this event. So he was from among them. He was among the fourth. He claimed always that he was the fourth person to accept Islam. And after the death of the Prophet ﷺ, he moved to Asham and he died in Al Hims. So he said, "Wa'adana Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam." The Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam gave us advice, and some narrations said after Salatul Fajr, which was a Sunnah of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam to advise after the Salat, you know, because it's a time where the people already gathered, which is the best. The Sunnah, the best time to give nasiha is a time where the people are already gathered as opposed to creating an event for advising any for which people get it is better to give an advice in a time or in a situation where the people are already gathered for a specific purpose so that is always better than to make the advice the reason for people gathering except if it is needed and there's a lot of hikmah in that so he was giving advice after fajr also it's the sunnah of the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam to do this sometimes it was never the sunnah of the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam to always give advice which is a problem in in our times people always want to talk and always want to give lectures no matter what in weddings it becomes like a conference Five, eight, six ustaz have to give a lecture. I don't know if that happens here, but it happens in our country. I can remember one time they had to, they split the wedding ceremony into two, the night before and the next day, because the person whose daughter was getting married, he knew all the ustaz. So he wanted all of them to give a talk. So it was like lecture after lecture after lecture. It's not, it's, it's a bad culture. People go to Aqiqa, you have to sit through two hours lecture. It's like we just, just want to eat. Like the reason we are here is to eat. So don't don't give lectures. Too much lecture is not good. After the and and it's not. It's really against the sunnah. Too much and long, long lectures is bad. It's really really against the sunnah. Um, when the people used to ask Abdullah ibn Mas'ud radiallahu anhu to give lectures, and he used to say no. And then sometimes he would, and then they'll ask for more, and he would say no. And they'll say, why are you refusing? He said, because I don't want people to get bored of it. Right? Because after a while, how many, you know, the people who go to lectures, uh, one of the problems with going to lectures is there's only certain type of things you can talk about. It's not like, it's not like you can give a lesson in a lecture. Right? You can't teach wudu. Nobody wants to hear wudu in a lecture, right? You never hear an imam saying, you don't hear that, right? So people are not learning technical things. So after a while, you're going to hear the same things over and over and over. And then after that, people think that, oh, I'm a scholar now, because I'm not hearing anything new, which means that I've maxed out all the ustads that I have to teach. And then what happens is that person starts his own lectures. Now. It's, so people confuse the lectures as an educational thing. So that's a problem. So Abdullah ibn Mas'ud said, no, I don't want to do that because people will get bored of it. So giving exhortations is sunnah based on this hadith. It is sunnah. So we can't go the opposite end like some people who say like all exhortations are bid'ah. No, all are not bid'ah. The Prophet ﷺ did it here. There's a hadith in which he did. So it's sunnah. 
but it's sunnah to be done occasionally, not all the time. And it's sunnah to be done by an alim. A non-alim should not be giving lectures or exhortations when it comes to the religion. Advices based on practical things, yeah, you always want to go to people who have experience. The elders are the best. But when it comes to religious exhortations, it should be done by ulama. Because a lot of times, a lot of the things that people give advice about, they don't know the technical aspects of it. They don't know the fiqh of it. And they confuse a lot of people. So a lot of people give lectures about birr walidain and they confuse that. Like, what are the fiqh of it? What if the parents don't, you know, they don't know the fiqh? What if somebody wants to do X? It's safe. They want to travel to do something that is safe. The road to the place and back from the place is safe. It's not a travel distance, all of that. And the parents say, no, do you have to listen fiqh-wise? Is it permissible to go anyway and ignore them? These are all fiqh things. The speakers, a lot of them don't know what the answer is and they give wrong answers all the time. One of the confused, for example, a lot of people believe that obedience of a wife to the husband is in all matters. They read it in the books, it's there. The word ta'a is mentioned in the books. You read it all the time. But what is meant by that? What is the fiqh of the word ta'a? If a husband tells a wife, hey, put on your hijab and go wash my car. Does she have to obey? She said no. Is she a disobedient wife? A lot of the speakers don't know. They just say you have to obey your husband. Okay, he told me to wash his car. He invited somebody home 12 at night and told me to cook. Do I have to? But you said, the speaker said, I have to obey my husband. I have to. Do I have to obey that? These are fiqh issues that they don't know, but they speak. So why are you advising if you don't know? If somebody asks you a question, what are you going to say now? So this is, this is a problem that we have with people speaking. So a lot of speakers and very little people who understand what they're speaking about, which is a sign of Yom Al-Qiyam. The Prophet ﷺ said to the companions that you are living in a time in which the lecturers are few, but the fuqaha are many. But you will see, a time will come in this ummah in which the lecturers will be many, but the fuqaha will be a few. So thank Allah that you've, he's telling the companions, thank Allah that you've seen the first time and seek refuge from Allah that you see the second time. We're seeing the second time where there's so many lecturers and half, not half, sorry, way more than half of them don't know anything about the religion, fiqh-wise. So, so it's sunnah. Wa'ad is sunnah from an alim if it's not too much and it's not too lengthy. Also from this hadith, we get that when we do wa'ad as opposed to teaching, it should be in a way that is impactful. Here the Prophet is not teaching. He's not teaching them fiqh. He's not teaching them ahkam. He's not teaching them anything technical. He's just giving advice to warm the heart, to motivate people. Those types of advice should be done in a way that is impactful. Because in this hadith, the person is describing, the narrator is describing, he started the narration by describing the impact. Before he gave the message, he described the impact that it had. It was an advice that we thought was a, a goodbye advice. It made the hearts fear and it made the, made the eyes tear up. He's, why he's saying this? Because he remembered the impact more than the message. So wa'ad should be impactful. It shouldn't be like you're teaching something. A right? classroom type environment is different from a lecture, from a, when you're trying to motivate people. So that is also sunnah. And this is what is meant by baligh in this hadith. The description here, the companion said it was mawa'idhatan baligha. Baligha here is not linguistic. Because balagha in Arabic is about eloquence of speech. So here when the companion said mawa'idha baligha, he's not talking about the, the he's not describing the, the language of the Prophet in terms that he wasn't saying it was eloquent. You say baligha, it means balagha qulubana, and it reached our heart. It was impactful. It was an impactful advice. It was an impactful uh, admonition from the Prophet. 
And then the companion said, we said to the Prophet فَقُلْنَا يَا رَسُولَ اللَّهِ And we said to him, it, it seems like a parting advice. And then they asked for more. From that, the fuqaha say that in sunnah, if we sense from an alim that he is in a higher hal, the ahwal of people will change, the spiritual states of people will go up and will go down, even for the awliya, even for the ulama. Sometimes you see them, they're in higher states. Sometimes you see them, they're in lower states. So if you sense that an alim is in a higher state of spiritual experience, ask in that moment for advice, ask for more, because the likelihood of what is going to be said and it being something special is there. So ask for it in those moments. Also, if you see, if you think an alim is going to leave, because the companion saying we thought it was a parting advice. It seemed that the Prophet ﷺ is giving a goodbye advice. If we think an alim is about to leave, whether it's leaving the world or leaving our locality, leaving our village, in those moments, seek the opportunity to ask whatever it is you have to ask. It's mustahab based on this hadith. The companions felt the Prophet ﷺ was leaving, they asked for more. So this is, is mustahab, it is sunnah. It is generally mustahab to ask from the ulama, except when we sense that it's not appropriate. If we sense, for example, an alim is angry, if we sense that he's dealing with some stress, if the alim is on the road, for example, walking, and he's true, you can see clearly he's busy, he's trying to get someplace. If you see he is dealing with something, right? If you see an alim is with his family, for example, eating food, in those situations, don't go asking questions. So, but generally, outside of that, it is mustahab, whenever you're in the presence of an alim, to ask, because we don't know how long they are going to be there. We don't know how long we're going to have access to ulama because they're, they're rare. So they asked for more. Now, when they asked for more, the Prophet ﷺ already told them what he wanted to tell them. Now they're asking for more. The Prophet ﷺ also, when he gave more, he didn't go on at length. He always tried to summarize big meaning in small words so that people can reflect on it and extract the benefits as they move on. Because you take the statement and then they can think about it more. The more they think about it, the more benefit they get. So the Prophet ﷺ told them, he said, uh, My advice to you is to have taqwa and to obey the leaders. In that statement, in that advice, the Prophet ﷺ combined the guiding principle of dunya and the guiding principle of the akhirah. Both of them in one advice. When it comes to your akhirah, because everybody is in the dunya to try to secure their akhirah. So with that, the Prophet ﷺ gave one advice that is the core principle, the guiding principle of how to deal with your akhirah. And that is taqwa. Whatever you do, have taqwa. Taqwa means always stay within the limits of the Sharia. Taqwa Allah means to protect yourself from Allah. That's what the word literally means. To have wiqaya from Allah. To have protection from the punishment of Allah. How do you do that? By obeying Allah. So taqwa means obey Allah in everything that you do. And that will secure your akhirah. And then he gave them advice by telling them what is the if not the, one of the most important principles to secure your salah of your dunya, the, the proper running of your dunya, and that is by obeying your leaders. See? Because without leadership, there is no, you know, the, the, the affairs of the dunya is in chaos if you don't have proper leadership. If you don't have leadership at all, it's going to be in chaos. And if you have leadership, no matter how bad it is, don't, yani, don't come out against the leaders. Because one of the important things is not permissible, according to the four madhabs, to rebel against the leaders with arms, to pick up 
arms against the leaders. Not permissible. There are situations in which it is permissible. I mean, there are conditions for its permissibility, but they're very difficult to actually achieve. So in general, don't come out against the leaders, which is one of the core ideas among one of the uh, global Muslim organizations that flourished within the 60s, 70s, coming up to the turn of the century, one of their core ideas was rebellion against the leaders. We have to, they believe. So the idea is still there, it's still present among many Muslim groups, but they're not as impactful anymore. But they are active. And one of their core ideas is that, which is a Marxist idea. In fact, the leaders of that movement were heavily impacted by Marxism. And that's well documented. Their books are like Marxist books with Islamic language. The vanguard. They talk about the vanguards of society. They talk about all of those. Same language as Marxism. So they used it. They used Marxism. They brought it over into Islam. And they created this revolution movement in Islam that confused a lot of young people. A lot of young university people thought that it was an Islamic duty to stand up against oppressive leaders. And they use hadith like to speak the truth in the face of an oppressive leader is the, one of the highest forms of jihad. But they're ignoring that the hadith said to speak the truth, not to take arms against the leader in order to speak the truth. You can write a letter to the leader, that's speaking the truth. You can write an open letter in the newspaper that is speaking the truth in the face of an oppressive leader. But to organize movements to come out, the result is the kind of chaos that we're seeing in most of the Middle East right now. That's the result of that attitude. And that's the reason that it's haram. So the Prophet is saying, for your akhirah, have taqwa. For your dunya, respect the leaders. Follow the rules and the detail of following the leader in terms of externally and, and internally, the details are there in the books of, of fiqh. But in general, the Prophet is saying, obey your leaders. And then he said, وَإِن تَأَمَّرَ عَلَيْكُمْ عَبْدٌ And in some versions of the hadith, عَبْدٌ حَبَشِيُّ Even if a slave assumes leadership over you. Now, in saying, even if a slave assumes leadership, there are two things happening here. The first is an unqualified person. Because by Sharia, a slave is not qualified to be the leader of the nation. I'm just using the word nation loosely because I don't know how else to describe it. But nation is a problem also. Nationhood is a problem. Citizenship is a problem. All of these concepts that we've, these political concepts are very problematic. The idea of nationhood and citizenship. And, but we don't know how else to describe it. So we we'll just use the word nation. So even if a slave, so one is a slave is unqualified according to Sharia. So that's the first thing the Prophet is saying, even if an unqualified person, it doesn't have to be a slave, just generally, if an unqualified person, there's a lot of people who believe that one of the leaders now of one of the most powerful countries on the planet is an unqualified leader, even if it's an unqualified leader. Whatever you believe the qualifications, if he's not qualified, even then the Prophet is saying, don't rebel against the leaders. So that's one one part of the analogy of saying a slave. The other one is people that you detest. Because slaves, and that's one of the reasons saying Habashi uh, in, the, in some versions of the hadith. Because slaves, you can have anybody can be a slave. But there are certain people where other people dislike them more. In, in, in the Arabian culture, it would have been the Ethiopians. But in many different parts of the world, it might be different people. If you go to some parts of the world, they hate like a race more than other races. They hate a tribe more than other tribes. They hate maybe people of a particular religion more than they hate. Like they can tolerate others more than some specifically. So even, the Prophet is telling the companions, even if that is the case, if culturally somebody who is the most detested of people become leaders over you, obey. So he's saying even combining the two ideas, 
even if an unqualified person from a type of people that you detest the most, if they assume leadership over you, obey them. Don't rebel against them. And your, your dunya will be okay. It will be in a state of uh, stability. But if you rebel, then you're creating chaos. And according to Sharia, it's better to have an unqualified person in leadership than to have chaos, which is the principle of the Sharia, also proven by this hadith, according to the scholars of Usul al Fiqh. And that is the permissibility of making a fiqhi decision based on a khaf al dararain, yani the, the least of two problems. So in this case, we have two problems. Unqualified leader, this against the Sharia. But chaos, okay, which of the two is worse? Do you want widespread chaos or somebody who's not qualified? Well, this is wrong, but it's the most, it's the easiest of the two situations. So go for the one that is less problematic. So in many, many, many of our decision making, we we'll have to employ that principle today. Many of it is like, okay, look, both are bad, but this is worse. So you will have to deal with the option that is the least problematic. So he said, even if this type of person becomes leader over you, then listen to him. And then the Prophet ﷺ is warning the companions, that those of you who are going to live after me, you're going to see in this version of the hadith, it says, اختلافاً كثيرا. You would see a lot of differences. In other versions of the hadith, it says, اختلافاً شديدا. You would see severe differences. So it's not just, he's not only concerned about the numerics, whether it's a lot numerically as opposed to a little numerically, but he's concerned about the severity. Maybe that's more important because two people can differ. You can have full opinions, but if we're all happy with each other, that's okay. It's like the madhabs, the madhabs that remain, they're four, but everybody's tolerant. Largely, I mean, there were moments in history where it became chaotic, but in general, the people who follow the four madhabs are happy with one another, right? In fact, they love one another. So it's, that doesn't matter that we have four as opposed to two. That's not what we're concerned about. When he said ikhtilaf kathir, it's interpreted by the other version that said ikhtilaf shadid. What we're concerned about is how strong the difference is, how people are responding to that difference. Because the stronger the difference, if the differences are severe, then people will die for whatever they believe in. There are some people willing to die over a small matter that they believe in. And it's easy to get people riled up to that extent and to capitalize on differences. So the Prophet Sallallahu is saying that you will see ikhtilaf and kathira. Here what he's talking about is religious differences. He's telling the companions that among this ummah, among the companions, among the Muslims, you will see a lot of splitting, a lot of differences. When that happens, he says, فَعَلَيْكُمْ بِسُنَّتِي when this happens, when the Muslims start to divide among themselves, then stick to my sunnah. Sunnah here means my way, my teachings in everything. In belief, my teachings in the way I act. You need to stick to that. So, فَعَلَيْكُمْ بِسُنَّتِي And then he said, وَالسُنَّةِ الْخُلَفَاءَ الرَّاشِدِينَ الْمَهْدِيِينَ the Khulafa al Rashidin. According to the majority opinion, the Khulafa al Rashidun were five Abu Bakr, Umar, Uthman, Ali, and Hassan. So these are the five Khulafa al Rashidun. He said, Fa'alaykum bi sunnati wa sunnat Khulafa al Rashidin. So uh, you follow my sunnah and the sunnah of the Khulafa. Now, when the Prophet is instructing people to follow the sunnah of the khulafa, that instruction is problematic. If you were to take that just externally, 
it's problematic because the Prophet ﷺ is commanding people to follow other than the Prophet ﷺ. So what is meant by the Khulafa al-Rashid or the Sunnah of the Khulafa? What is meant according to the ulama is the Prophet ﷺ knew that the Khulafa, obviously he knew who they were going to be. The Prophet ﷺ said, I was giving knowledge of the past and of the future. So he knew who they were going to be. And he knew that they were mujtahid ulama, every one of them. Abu Bakr, Umar, Uthman, Ali, these were all mujtahid imams of the ummah. So he, was no, he, knew, he knew that their sunnah would be his sunnah. He knew that whatever they say would not go against the Quran and the sunnah of the Prophet So when he said, follow my sunnah, and the sunnah of the Khulafa al-Rashidin is like saying, I am guaranteeing you that the sunnah of the Khulafa al-Rashidin will be in conformity with the Quran and the sunnah. So it's like saying follow the Qur'an and the Sunnah through the ijtihad and the practice of the Khulafa al-Rashidun. Or according to some of them, some of the ulama, what they say is the Prophet wasallam knew that some of his Sunnah would not be implemented except after him. And some of the things that he taught would not be applicable. So when he was alive, the companions followed his Sunnah. They saw how he lived they follow him. But some of his teachings would not, the situation would not be present for them to be implemented until after he passed away. And that will play out as the time moves on. And that will happen, a lot of it will happen in the time of the Khulafa. So he's telling the companions, when I'm not there to give you guidance, when these things will have to play out, follow the Khulafa al rashid They will show you how to implement the Sunnah in those times and by extension the the mujtahid imams after them yani people who would follow their way of implementing the sunnah of the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam he said follow my sunnah and the sunnah of the khulafa al-rashidin al-mahdiyin these two description yani al-rashidin al-mahdiyin are basically the same thing and it's just basically saying that the, the Khulafa would be on guidance. Abdu alayha bin nawajiz. Hold on to it with your, with your molar teeth. Now, what he's saying here is he's giving an analogy according to some of the ulama. It's like things will get stormy after the death of the Prophet wasallam. Things will get rough. It will be like storms hitting you and in a storm imagine a flood imagine a, a tornado or something like that that is pulling you away and you have to scramble onto something to remain stable you would grab on with everything that you have right if you can grab with your toe you'll grab with your toe and you'll grab with everything that you have so the analogy is that in the storm that is going to hit the fitna, that is going to hit the summa. When you're being pulled in every single direction, things will get to the ikhtilaf. He's saying that the ikhtilaf will be kafir. So imagine the, the ikhtilaf, the analogy of it, as a storm. And it will be shadid. So imagine this storm of fitna pulling you in all sorts of direction. And you have to hold on to the sunnah. Imagine. A tornado, imagine the sun is like something, I don't know what will remain stable in a, in a tornado. But that one thing that will remain stable, imagine that that's the sunnah. Grab onto that with whatever you have. So he's saying, if your last resort, the only way to hold on is by biting onto it, and then do that. In other words, don't allow yourself, no matter what you do. If your hands break off and your feet break off, and the only thing to hold up, in other words, don't even at that point give up. Don't allow yourself to be pulled in these different directions. Hold on to the sunnah with everything that you have. <clears throat> According to some of the ulama, the other meaning of the hadith is, or the other analogy, that's one analogy. One analogy is that the ikhtilaf is like a storm pulling you in different directions. Hold on to the sunnah with everything that you have. According to some of the ulama, the meaning of the analogy is when people have to have sabr, and somebody is being tested, they're in a situation where it's hard. One of the things, one of the signs that somebody is under like mental pressure is that they bite down on their teeth. 
right? When you're angry, what do you do? How do you know a child is angry? It's not by their smiling. When they, like, ah, 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 that pointing down on the teeth. That way he's talking about. That sort of holding on to the sunnah, like that level of sabr, where it's difficult, just bite, bite down, you know, in, 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 in combat sports. I keep coming back to combat sports. <laughs> in combat sports, there's an analogy they say that, like in, when you lose control of a fight, they say bite down on the mouth guard on your, mm-hmm. and just go. In other words, don't be afraid. You have to go into that, weather that storm. Bite down, like that. so the idea of bite down on, on it, that's the analogy they say. So the Prophet Sallallahu is other other words what he's saying is when it gets difficult, just bite down on the teeth guard and, and you just stay in the sunnah. That's it. like whatever you have to persevere. Just bite down and stay with it. Don't give up. This in other words, it's an analogy of sabr. No matter how hard it get, weather it, weather that storm. Stick to the sunnah. No matter how difficult it becomes, stick to the sunnah. So no matter how, like, governments will be against the sunnah. Your own Muslim people will be, and there are time will come and your own Muslim people will be against the sunnah. There are Muslims in the in certain parts of the world where the kids want to wear hijab and the parents are pressuring them to take it off. Like, that's the level where your own people are going to be against the sunnah. No matter what it is, no matter how it becomes, stick with it. That's what the Prophet Sallallahu is saying. That's how some of the ulama interpreted the statement, Abdu Aliha bin Bite onto it with your molars. And they say, muhtathatil umur. And I warn you against innovated matters. We mentioned in earlier lessons that the meaning of an innovation is something new in belief or action. Belief, action, or statement that is not justified by revelation, either by the text of the revelation or by the principles of the revelation. That is the meaning of a bid'ah, something that's innovated in the religion, meaning it cannot be justified in any way, in any systematic, proper way from the revelation that this is something that is approved by the religion. So new matters, whether it's an idea, whether it's a belief, a statement, or an act, if it's not justified by the religion, then stay away from it. Because every newly invented matter is misguided. So the Prophet is giving a principle to, to the Muslims. Which is basically, you can ask yourself this question. Okay, somebody's proposing something new. None of the ulama ever said it before. In fact, the people who study the works of the ulama are against it. It's brand new. Somebody's proposing it. And you, you are hearing about this. You want to, should I listen to this guy? Should I get on board on this idea? The Prophet is saying, just ask yourself, is it new? Yeah, well, okay, stay. Why? It's dalala. You don't need to know if it's dalala. The Prophet said, فَإِنَّ كُلَّ مُحْدَثَةٍ بِدْعَةٍ Is it new? Yes. Well, the Prophet answered that question. It's a bid'ah. Stay away from it. It's dalala. كُلَّ بِدْعَةٍ dalala. Like, is there, you hear it all the time. I don't know if I mentioned here, but I think I did. There is this khatib here in Malaysia that gave a few khutbas and in every one of those khutbah, he's saying, oh, I came up with a new way of interpreting the Qur'an. And then he, the rest of the khutbah is telling you what that way is. I came up with this new methodology. of. It. I came up with this new definition of fiqh. I came up with this, well, okay, it's, it's dalala. I, mean, I don't need to hear the rest. Once you tell me you just came up with a new, okay, khalas, come off of the minbar. Kulla bid'atin dalala. Is it new? Yeah. You came up with it? Yeah. When? A ah, few months. Okay. Kulla bid'atin dalala. Like, don't even pitch the rest of it. Once you're telling me it's brand new, okay, khalas. Kulla bid'ah dalala. Every bid'ah, every new thing in the religion is a dalala. We don't need to hear the rest of it. So, that's what it means. And we can't go the other extreme, right? Another extreme that exists in the ummah 
where if you don't have a direct text for anything, it's a bid'ah and all of it. This is not what it means, what it means either. <coughs> and then we go on to the next one, the 29th hadith. So, Imam al Nawawi rahimahullah ta'ala narrated through an unbroken chain of narration to Mu'adh ibn Jabal radiallahu ta'ala anhu who said, Qultu ya Rasulallah, akhbirni bi'amalin yudkhiluni al-jannah wa yuba'iduni min al-nar. Mu'adh ibn Jabal radiallahu anhu who we've spoken about in the past said, I said to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, to the messenger of Allah, tell me of an act that would cause me to enter Jannah and would cause me to be distanced from the fire. And the Prophet ﷺ said, لَقَدْ سَأَلْتَ عَنْ عَظِيمٍ You've asked about something great. Now, when Mu'adh ibn Jabal said, tell me about an act that would cause me to enter Jannah, it is not the act that causes him to enter Jannah. We know that actions would not cause anybody to enter Jannah. The Prophet ﷺ said in the hadith, nobody enters Jannah because of his actions. The companion said, not even you. And the Prophet ﷺ said, not even me. Right? لا أحد دخل الجنة إلا برحمة الله Nobody enters Jannah except by the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So then what does this hadith mean? Mu'adh ibn Jabal certainly understood that actions are related to a person's entrance into Jannah. That's why he asked. The, the question already assumes the premise that actions can cause people to enter Jannah. Because he's not asking the Prophet, would actions cause people to enter Jannah? That's not the question. He assumed that that's already there. He already assumed that premise. So he's not asking, would actions enter? No, he's saying, tell me of an action that would cause me to enter. And the Prophet ﷺ didn't object to the question. So what does it mean if the Prophet ﷺ already said that actions don't cause anybody to enter Jannah? So Rahmah of Allah, the mercy of Allah is what causes people to enter Jannah. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has made a relationship between certain actions and His mercy. Whereby if you do these actions, you gain the mercy of Allah. So the question becomes, tell me of an act that would gain me the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala by which I would enter Jannah. So the, the act brings about the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in a normative sense, not in a necessary sense. Normative sense means that the relationship is a re- it's a relationship of normativity. This act would normally cause the rahmah of Allah, and the opposite would normally bring about the wrath of Allah Azza But not it's not necessary. This is not a necessary causation where this would necessarily bring the rahmah of Allah, or the opposite would necessarily bring the wrath of Allah Azza wa Jalla. Allah can punish whomever He wants, and Allah Azza wa Jal can forgive whomever He wants. According to the Ash'ari Maturidi belief, we say that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala can punish the obedient servant, and Allah Azza wa Jal can reward the disobedient servant. Can meaning it's possible. It's a rational possibility. It's not a rational necessity that Allah Azza wa Jal grants mercy to the obedient servant, and that Allah Azza wa Jal punishes the disobedient servant. It's a normative relationship, not a necessary relationship. So, the meaning of the question is, tell me of an act that would gain the mercy of Allah Azza wa by which I would enter Jannah and be distanced from the fire. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, uh, لَقَدْ سَأَلْتَ عَنْ عَظِيمٍ You've asked about something great. Either the Prophet وسلم, is referring here to the question. You, you, you've asked the act itself. You've asked about an action that is great. Meaning, you're asking about entrance into, into Jannah and distance from the fire. That act, because you said, tell me about one act, amal. You didn't say amal. Tell me about one act. So the Prophet وسلم, could be referring to the act. You're asking about a great act. If it has that level of you know, results, then it must be something great. 
or it can mean entrance into fire, uh, sorry, entrance into Jannah and distance from the fire. When the Prophet said, you have asked about something great, linguistically, these are the two possibilities. We don't know. We're just trying to analyze the language of the hadith. We don't know exactly what he meant. Is it the act that you're talking about or the results? But either of it, you're asking about something great, which from the hadith, the fuqaha derived the istihbab, it is mustahab, according to sharia, for the teacher to compliment the questioner if they've asked a great question. Just to, in, maybe to encourage others, to build the confidence of others, to just uh, praise the person for their good. And this is something in the teaching method of the Prophet said that was normal. Sometimes they will say, and he would say, Ahsent, and you've done well. Just to encourage uh, the student. So he, he said, you've asked about something great. Um, now Mu'adh ibn Jabal radiallahu anhu, according to other narrations, other versions of the hadith, he took a while before he asked this question. It's something he wanted to ask for a long time. But he didn't. And according to some of the ulama, that's also why the Prophet ﷺ praised him. Because he knew he, he didn't want to ask the question or that he waited a while. So when he actually did ask the question, the Prophet ﷺ praised him for it. Now the reason he didn't want to ask it because the ayah of the Qur'an was revealed, يَا أَيُّهَا الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا لَا تَسْأَلُوا عَنْ أَشْيَاءَ إِنْ تُبْدَأْ لَكُمْ تَسُؤْكُمْ O you who believe, don't ask about things that when the answer becomes clear to you, it will be harmful to you. So he was concerned that if I ask this question, the Prophet ﷺ will give me a response that I would not be able to, to do. So then it would have been better for me not, because now I, I, if I get an answer, I would know what the answer is, but also know that I can't do that. And that would be, that would bother me. So don't ask about something that if the answer becomes clear to you, it will harm you. So he thought, maybe I shouldn't ask because of that ayah. So he wanted to ask for days. And then when he finally asked, the Prophet said, You've asked about something great. And then he said, because of the worry that Mu'adh ibn Jabal had, إِنَّهُ لَا يُسْرٌ إِنَّهُ because Mu'az thought that if I asked this question, the Prophet ﷺ would give me an answer that would be difficult. So the Prophet ﷺ said, you've asked about something great and it is easy for whomever Allah makes it easy for. So that he took away the concern of Mu'ad ibn Jabal anhu, right away. He knew he didn't want to ask, he praised him, no. In other words, you've done great for asking. He was worried it will be too difficult. Right away, the Prophet said, It will be easy for whomever Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala makes it easy for. According to the fuqaha, again, it is mustahab for the teacher or the mufti. If somebody comes with a question and they know it was heavy, to dispel from them their worry right away. So these are like people who are in the education field should go through all of these and extract these educational principles as it relates to the adab of teaching. So he dispelled the concern that Mu'adh ibn Jabal had عنه, right away. He said that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will make it easy for whomever yani he wants. And then he gave the answer. The first thing is la tushrik bihi shay'a. First thing is to accept Islam. To say the shahada. Anybody who worships Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala only and without committing shirk, that is shara'i. There are two types of shirk. There's shirk that is considered shirk according to the sharia, that has legal implication, that determines a Muslim from a non-Muslim. That type of shirk is the shirk the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam meaning in this hadith. Ta'abudullah, worship Allah, la tushrik bihi shay'a, and don't commit shirk 
And by shirk, he meant shar'i shirk. The other type of shirk is what you would read about in the books of Tasawwuf. That is not shirk according to Sharia. It's not a technical shirk. It doesn't have any legal implication. And for them, if you fear anything along with your fear of Allah, or love anything along with your love of Allah, or is concerned about anything along with your concern about Allah subhanahu wa then you're committing shirk according to the Sufis. And the reason for that is because their pursuit is to achieve a level of purity whereby the only thing that is present in the heart is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That if you cut the heart, they say if you were to cut the heart and look inside of it, the only thing would be there is Allah, nothing else. It would be Allah and the worry for dunya. Allah and the love for dunya. It will just be Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So, you know, you have to be clear with this because a lot of, again, the speakers, a lot of the things I say is because of a lot of things the speakers say. A lot of them will explain the hadith, but they explain the meaning of shirk according to the Sufi meaning and make everybody get depressed. In other words, no. Here, don't worry, everybody, there's no Muslim who says shahada and is serious about that that is committing shirk. This is why the Prophet ﷺ said, I'm not even worried about shirk for my ummah. There's a hadith that said, I'm not worried about shirk for my ummah. I mean, that's the last thing that I'm worried about. I'm worried about differences. I'm worried about them fighting. I'm worried about their love of dunya. That's what he said. But shirk, that's the last of my concern for them. It's not easy for them to commit shirk. So shirk here means technical shar'i shirk. La tushrik billahi, la tushrik bihi shay'a. And to establish prayer. And we've mentioned before that the meaning of iqama here can be either the taqweem, sorry, this taqweem can either go back to taqweem or iqama. Iqama means to establish the prayer on time and yani, properly according to the rules of sharia. Iqam, tuqimu salah. Establish the prayer, meaning on time, awrah, covered, in a state of tahara, facing the qibla, except when you have an excuse according to sharia. Yani in jama'ah, if, if it's possible. That's what he meant. Tuqimu salah. If it goes back to taqweem, then what it means is to properly establish the prayer. Meaning to taqweem is to build upon it, meaning you're better every time. You start with Fajr and Dhuhr was better than Fajr and Asr was better than Dhuhr and Maghrib was better than Asr and your Isha was better than your Maghrib. Yani Tuqeem, constantly do it better. So Tuqeem was Salah, establish the prayer properly according to the rules of Sharia. Wa Tuqti as Zakah, and then you give the Zakah according to the rules of Zakah. Wa Tasum Ramadan, and that you fast in the month of Ramadan, wa Tahujjul Bayt, and you make Hajj whenever. You can. If you do that, yani, Mu'adh ibn Jabal said, tell me about an act that would cause me to enter Jannah. And the Prophet sallallahu gave him the five arkan of Islam. Instead of, in other words, from that the ulama say, all of them are treated as a single act. In other words, establish Islam. And yani, you have istiqama. It's like those hadith when he said, say la ilaha illallah, so if we were to extract the one act that Mu'ad ibn Jabal asked about, because he said, tell me about one action, that one thing, if we were to express it in a single word, it would be istiqama. Have istiqama, meaning properly establish Islam. And you will enter Jannah. And again, it's not limited to these five. It just simply means follow the rules of the Sharia properly. It doesn't mean somebody can say, oh, if I do these five things based on this hadith, but I don't marry according to Islam, and I don't sell and buy according to Islam, and I don't rent according to Islam, and I don't travel, like all of the other rules of Sharia, I'm gonna ignore because this hadith mentioned five things. No, that's not what it's meant. It's meant properly establish the rules of Islam, the rules of Sharia. And then the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, Thumma uh, qala, ala, no, he said, he said, should I not tell you about the doors of khair? 
again mustahab or the fuqaha extract from the hadith that it is mustahab it is recommended for the alim for the teacher if he senses that he can give more to a student without overburdening the student and it's going to be beneficial for the student and it is in line with what the student is asking about then he it's permissible and he can we're not saying we should or not we're saying it's per, it's permissible it might be mustahab in some cases might be makruh in some cases but it's permissible so if on the specific question can an alim do this yes he can the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam answered the question of muad and then gave him more now he said should i not tell you about the abwab of khair the doors of khair what this means is that a door usually would lead you into into a room so and the door usually you know if you say to something not from this is the door to something it means that the door is you're coming from the outside and the door gives you access to what is inside so the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam is saying i'll give you guidance to the abwab of khair meaning the the inner the spiritual benefits these doors i'm going to mention to you if you open them if you access them you will get benefit to the internal spiritual benefits so these are external things like doors are but once you access them you will have internal, internal spiritual benefits so he's saying these are the door to khair one sun so was so dunna he did not only tell him what it is he gave a description for each so these are what even in the sharia we call them external things fasting is an external thing it's zahir it's eating and abstinence these are external things but those external things the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam said they are abwab al khair they are doors to internal things. so fasting is the door to sabr it is the door to rida to to sabr means the patient which is an internal thing to be pleased with the will of allah subhanahu wa ta'ala which is an internal thing it's so there are other spiritual benefits of fasting so he said as sawu junna fasting is a shield it guards you from maasi it's guard it guards you from sins it guards you from the fire it guards you from shahawat from indulging in your own desires and by doing that you will gain the internal benefits of fasting so he said was as sawu junna والصدقة تطفئ الخطيئة كما يطفئ الماء النار and صدقة puts out the fire the flames of خطيئة the way water puts out fire now what the علماء differ what is mean what is meant by تطفئ الخطيئة that صدقة puts out the flames of sins So some of them say what it means by the flame of sins is that flame is an analogy to desire. Desire leads to sins. Sadaqa puts out the flames of those desires that leads to sin. So people who do reg- regular charity the spiritual benefit of that is they will their desire for dunya will decrease. And as their desire for dunya decreases the amount of sins that they commit based on those desires will go down so when you see people doing externally they do a lot of sins advise them to do a lot of sadaqa to put out the flames of those sins this is why the person asam said it took fit a khatiya it it puts out the flames of that some say that what it means is that it 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 puts out the flames of khatiya in the akhirah meaning the fire of the akhirah that is warranted by your khatiya your because of your charity allah azza wa jalla will forgive you for those sins in the akhirah so putting out the flames some of them say it means the flames of the fire 
because your sadaqah would bring the mercy of Allah and will forgive you for your khati'ah, for your sins. So either way, yani sadaqah in the dunya saves you from punishment in the akhir. Wa salatul rajuli min jawfil layl and the fasting of a person in the middle of the night. Here it says a rajul, which means man, but the hadith is general, means person. The salah of a person in jawfil layl, a person's prayer in the in the depth of the night. According to the fuqaha, there is a difference on any, which part of the night is best for prayer. According to Imam Shafi'i, radiallahu anhu, he said, if you split it in two, then the second half is better than the first half. So after Isha, you can pray. But if you split it in two, then the second half is the best. It is better to pray than the first half. And if you split it in three, then the last third is better than the first two thirds. According to the Imam Shafi. So if you split it in two, the second half. If you split it in three, the last third. If you split it in six, then the fourth and the fifth, sixth, is better. According to the Imam Shafi. So not the last, if you split it in the sixth, then the best is the fourth and the fifth. And then you relax in the sixth before Fajr. But prayer in the night after sleep is better than before. If you pray after you sleep, sunnah prayers after you sleep and you wake back, this is what is called tahajjud. It's different from qiyam al-layl. Qiyam al-layl, you don't have to sleep. If you do taraweeh, for example, after you sleep, then it will be taraweeh and tahajjud. Because tahajjud is simply Praying sunnah prayers after you sleep. So if you sleep, you wake up back and you pray sunnah prayer. Those sunnah are called tahajjud automatically. So if you pray taraweeh, it's automatically tahajjud. If you pray any sunnah, mutlaq sunnah, if you missed all of your sunnah during the day, for example, and then you woke up at night, you say, you know, I'm going to make up for them. So you pray the sunnah of, of fajr and duhr and, and of Maghrib and Isha, you pray of it after you woke up, all of that will be tahajjud and it will be qada for the sunnah that you miss during the day. So, we say, وَالصَّلَاةُ الرَّجُلِ مِنْ جَوْفِ اللَّيْلِ And then the Prophet ﷺ recited the ayah ثُمَّ تَلَى تَتَجَافَ جُنُوبُهُمْ عَنِ الْمَضَاجِعِ حَتَّى بَلَغَ يَعْمِلُ So in Surah Sajda, the Prophet ﷺ read the ayah that there Sides are separated from their beds. And he, he's talking about people who pray, tahajjud, yani those who are able to separate themselves from their beds. And um, yeah, according to the ulama, to be from among the people of tahajjud, it's enough to pray two rak'ah, each rak'ah containing five ayat, based on another hadith of the Prophet. So if that's all somebody can do, then do that. If you can't wake up, then at least do it before you sleep. Last thing you do, you pray Aisha, you pray all of the Sunnah of Aisha, you pray before you pray Witr, pray two rak'ah with the intention of extra prayer in the night, two rak'ah, five ayat each. If you can wake up just 10 minutes before Fajr, enough to make wudu and pray just two rak'ah then do that that's enough to be written among the people of tahajjud you wake up 10 minutes before fajr and then always sleep with the intention of praying tahajjud even if you know you know you're not gonna get up you sleep with the intention of if just i intend to you know you're not going to but even if you know you're not going to make the intention it might have some barakah. The intention might have some barakah. If it doesn't have some barakah enough to make an impact, at least you'll be rewarded for the intention. You made a serious, I intend to wake up tonight, pray, before you sleep. According to some of the ahadith, if you do that, the angels pray for you. So there are angels assigned for that. 
So they're there, the, this person intended, they're looking. <laughs> like, ah, he's not going to make it. They're going to do it for you. And you get the rewards of it. So he said, well, salah. But that salah of a person at the night, he said, and the, the ulama, the, the ulama of Tasawwuf, they talk about him. That salah, the impact of salah during the night is incredible. The connection that somebody can get with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala by praying during the night is something that a lot of other actions will not be able to get you. Salah, bilayli wa nasu niyam. When you're awake and everybody else is asleep. It also develops sincerity. Because nobody can see you. At that point, you have to want it. That's somebody who just wants it. To wake up and do According to Abdullah Masood Masood, he said, somebody asked him, why is it that people can't get up? He said, because their sins are too heavy. He said, weighs them down. But of course, we interpret those things, and for people who, their situation is easy. But if somebody's situation is hard, they work all day, it's hard work, you're not going to go tell them, hey, like make them feel bad that they can't get up at home. Just let them sleep. So it's not about that. It's about people who, they're sinning by day, they have there's no reason to not get up. So if somebody has no reason not to get up, it's not difficult, he doesn't need all that sleep, he's sleeping all day anyway, right? <laughs> Playing Minecraft for hours, whatever it is. And then that person says, you know, I just can't get up, I'm so tired. Tired doing what? <laughs> those is what he said. Those people, their sins. Their sins are too heavy. So you try to get up, it's just a heavy bad of sin that is pulling you down. So make tawbah, it'll become easy. If you wake up, you, you want to get up, you just can't start making istighfar and you'll get lighter, lighter, lighter. You'll be able to get up. So we'll continue from here in the next session, inshallah. Wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'ina wa alhamdulillahi wa